In 1517, a simple yet efficient protest against the corruption that engulfed the Catholic Church became an unstoppable wave of religious change. This episode in our history is known as the Reformation and it radically changed the political, social and economic scenes of Europe. Centuries after this event, the heritage of these changes can still be seen throughout the world. Hi, my name is Sebastian and you're watching 7 Facts. The Middle Ages were dominated by the Catholic Church, an institution that became really, really powerful. Well, at least in Western Europe, Eastern Europe had its own thing. But the power and might of the Catholic Church began to shake around the 16th century. Except that's not quite right, attempts to reform the church were made long before this. The Lollards of England, for instance, appeared in the 14th century following the teachings of John Wycliffe. The Hussites of Bohemia were a Czech group of proto-Protestants who were led by Jan Hus in the 15th century. So cracks in the airtight grip of the Catholic Church began to appear before the Great Reformation. But the Church itself was also seemingly self-sabotaging. Pope Clement V decided in 1309 to move his court out of Rome and into Avignon. A line of seven popes then reigned from Avignon until in 1376 when Pope Gregory XI decided to move back to Rome. Then his successors had disagreements, factions emerged and all of a sudden a second line of Avignon popes reappeared. This is known as the Western Schism and it ended by electing yet another third pope in 1417 that replaced the other two. And these political machinations were then supplemented by the excesses of the Renaissance. The St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, although beautiful and awe-inspiring, was very controversial at the time of its construction. Why? Because it was partly financed by the Pope through the sale of indulgences, remissions of sin that would reduce your punishment in the afterlife. Of course, indulgences were not free. The Basilica took 120 years to be built and the papacy hired the most renowned artists of the Renaissance to decorate it. This behavior of the Catholic Church was seen as corrupt and extravagant and it was widespread. Then came Martin Luther and all of a sudden, everything changed. Martin Luther was a German theologian, priest, professor and monk. In 1512, he was a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg in the Electorate of Saxony. He had been in conflict with members of the church and was dissatisfied with what was happening. And in 1517, he finally had enough. That year, a priest, Johann Tetzel, arrived in Wittenberg selling indulgences to raise money for Pope Leon X. These indulgences had long been criticized by many theologians, but these clever inventions were selling really well, so there was practically no chance that someone would ban them. But on October 23rd, 1517, Martin felt like he had to react. And he did so by publishing his 95 theses on the doors of the church. His theses were not radical or outrageous, but they attracted a large audience and because Europe was making huge advances in the printing press, Luther's document spread like wildfire. No one knew it at the time, but those 95 theses were the start of the Reformation and the birth of Protestantism. Initially, Luther criticized the selling of indulgences, but then continued by attacking a fundamental dogma of Catholicism, the transubstantiation, the belief that during communion the bread and wine turn into the body and blood of Christ. Instead, he preached consubstantiation, as in Christ is indeed present during communion but alongside the bread and wine. A minor change for sure, but this was borderline heresy. Luther also questioned priesthood celibacy and the supremacy of the Catholic Pope and called for a reform of religious orders and a return to the simplicity of the Church from its inception. Questioning the unquestionable authority of the church brought a lot of followers towards Martin Luther, but it's worth noting that he didn't want to create an entire new system. He tried to reform the existing church. Attempts were made to reconcile Luther's beliefs with the existing religious authorities unsuccessfully. 
1521, he was invited to present his opinions in the Diet or Parliament of Worms in front of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Of course, Luther refused to renounce his ideas, and so, in addition to already being excommunicated from the church, now he was also banned by the emperor. Citizens of the Holy Roman Empire were now forbidden to defend or propagate the ideas and teachings of Martin Luther. Despite now being an outlaw, Martin Luther survived and established his own church. He translated the Bible from Latin into German so that everyone can understand it, not just the well-educated. Luther's teachings were powerful, but they also came at the right time. Germany back then didn't exist. The German nation was split into many, many small states, all subordinate to the Holy Roman Emperor. But there were some princes that didn't like this. They wanted to limit and counter the powers of the Emperor and the Church. Luther's teachings were the perfect medium to create a rift. So this religious debate quickly turned into a political revolution. If these princes could manage to break away from the Roman Church, they wouldn't have to pay the obligatory taxes for the Pope. So a nationalistic slogan was born, German money for a German Church. Problem was that this led to an immense burden on the peasantry. They were no longer allowed to hunt, fish or even chop wood freely. This in addition to heavy taxes, no rights, no lands, not even the right to freely marry. So, as you can imagine, a war broke out, the German Peasants' War in 1524. The war killed, or rather slaughtered, some 300,000 peasants, and it terrified both Luther and the princes. Nevertheless, Protestantism spread. The northern German states of Saxony, Hesse, Brandenburg, Brunswick and others adopted Lutheranism and severed their ties with Rome. Each of these states took control of the church and used it to consolidate the power of the local leader over their people. As complex and messy as the Reformation was starting to become in Germany, it was still an enticing and attractive idea. So it continued to spread in Europe. In the north, Sweden broke away from the Kalmar Union, the royal union between Sweden, Denmark and Norway. Gustav Eriksson Vasa was now Gustav I of Sweden, and in 1527 he confiscated the lands of the church to obtain funds for his new kingdom. He reformed the state church under the guidelines of Lutheranism. Denmark-Norway, the remnant of the Kalmar Union, followed suit in 1536, where Lutheranism also became the state religion. In England, it was Henry VIII who decided to break away from the Roman Church after the Pope refused to grant him a divorce from Catherine of Aragon. Thus, in 1534, the Church of England was no longer Catholic and Anglicanism was born. With such developments, Rome had to respond. And it was under the leadership of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V that a political response was in the makings. However, the Reformation wasn't the only issue that plagued Western Europe. The Holy Roman Empire was vast and powerful, but it wasn't alone. Charles was in conflict with neighboring France, but also with the increasingly more powerful Ottoman Empire in the southeast. What this meant was that the empire couldn't devote all of its resources against the Protestants. The Schmalkaldic War was fought between the imperial forces and a league of Protestant princes. While the empire won, they couldn't get rid of Protestantism, it was far too late for that. So a compromise was reached with the Peace of Augsburg. The legal division of Christianity within the empire was now permanent. From now on, rulers were legally allowed to choose between Lutheranism and Roman Catholicism. Martin Luther initiated the reform, but he was an orderly man, conservationist in his views. But many of his religious descendants were much more radical. Huldrich Zwingli was a Swiss reformer in many ways similar to Luther. In 1523, his 67 theses were adopted by the Council of Zurich and the city used them as their official religious doctrine. However, Zwingli didn't agree with Luther on the whole communion thing and started to lead his church on a different, more radical and anti-hierarchical path. He died in 1531 while defending Zurich from the other Catholic Swiss cantons. 
While his death slowed down the reform in Switzerland, it didn't stop it. Another man, based in Geneva, would soon become the leader of the reform, Jean Calvin. Calvin was born in Paris in 1509 and studied to become a theologian. In 1533, though, he converted to this new reformed religion and settled in Geneva. There, he created a more austere form of Protestantism based on his own interpretation of the scriptures and on his own rigorous academic career. He put special emphasis on predestination, God's control over man. While he didn't elaborate any practical theories on resistance against the corrupt Catholic Church, his later followers had no problem in justifying their violent resistance using his teachings. Calvin, like Luther, insisted on a direct relationship between the individual and God, and the primacy of the Bible. However, unlike Luther, who believed in the political subordination of the church to the state, Calvin believed the two should work together on equal footing, with the aim of creating a devout society with a strict code of honor. The combined teachings of Zwingli and Calvin spread to Scotland, Netherlands, France, Bohemia and Transylvania and were known as Calvinism, or Reformed Protestantism. Later, it led to the appearance of the Puritans, a much more extreme and strict religious sect aimed against the Anglican Church. The initial response of the Catholic Church was to excommunicate anyone who revolted against it. But pretty soon it became obvious that this wasn't gonna stop the Reformation. So the church decided to do its own Reformation based on the calls that preceded Luther's teachings. This was the Counter-Reformation, or the Catholic Revival. Its aim was to reduce the public's interest in the new Protestant churches through a reformation and remodeling of the old Catholic Church. This counter-reformation managed to consolidate the papacy, it recreated old religious orders, founded new ones, established schools and missions and clarified some Catholic doctrines. It also enabled some religious debates, released some apologetic documents, while at the same time heresy trials and the activity of the Inquisition became more important. The Counter-Reformation achieved its goals and Catholicism became stronger, both as a religion and as a political movement. In places like Poland or Austria, Catholicism was the incontestable religion of the state. While in German lands it was mostly peace, in other parts trouble was brewing. The increasingly larger number of Calvinists in France led to a long and bloody religious struggle that only ended in 1598. By the end of the 16th century, nearly 40% of Europeans were now Protestants, but there was no peaceful cohabitation. The Thirty Years' War broke out in 1618 and began as a religious conflict between Catholic Austria and Protestant Bohemia. The war then turned into a political battle for supremacy between France, Spain and Austria. It became one of the longest and most destructive wars in European history, killing as many as 8 million people. Thankfully, this was the last major religious war in Europe. But it's kinda ironic how large debates about religions that preach peace and love always seem to end up in bloodbaths. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. You can leave your comments downstairs and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.